I'm going to do my best not to look at that screen. <laughs> All right. I think just I, except when you're like doing some breadboard thing. Right. Right. All right. So I, well, maybe that, maybe that's what I should be looking at the whole time. Maybe. I mean, the problem is that you'll have a delay between me saying stuff and you hearing it, but yeah. Uh, but I think, <laughs> I think we're actually live. So let's, okay. let's smile and wave. Hello people. Um, welcome to this edition of reverse engineering. Um, with a guest. This time we have uh, Dave Hillowitz, who is joining us hey everyone. Um, as we try to kind of uh, look into reverb, uh, reverb, like spring reverb, uh, a, str a spring reverb circuit. Sorry, I'm a bit nervous today. Um, all right. So uh, let me first introduce our guest. Uh, like I said, it's Dave Hillowitz. Uh, he is a composer from Philadelphia. He uh, scores movies. Uh, he also works with video games, I think. Um, and I think uh, people that n watch my channel probably know you from your channel, where you kind of do music uh, creation tutorials. You talk about instruments that you like, uh, weird instruments that you find somewhere. Um, you also talk about synthesizers and you kind of dabble also in electronics. So I saw you like a couple times, um, you know, looking at circuits and uh, also building circuits. And that's actually why I decided to um, invite you on the stream because I thought it would be a good match. Um, and uh, we had a call like a couple weeks back and we were like talking about what we would want to look at. And it kind of quickly became clear that um, we were both interested in effects, uh, particularly either delay or reverb. And I would like to ask you to give a bit of background, like why you're interested in looking at reverb specifically. Me? Oh, I've got a bunch of different things. Uh, I've done a lot of experiments with reverb tanks, uh, with uh, spring, spring reverb, uh, you know, uh, both putting spring reverbs inside of instruments, um, but I've never actually built the electronics component that leads up to them. So that that's something I've always been curious about. In theory, I'd love to build something that I could put in my Euro rack over there. It's got a nice, I don't know, 8U, something like that. I don't know how many, how many HP uh, <laughs> uh, I have left, but uh, hopefully I can build something that will fit in that one little gap because I don't have any effects on it. Right. That makes sense. I always love it like to have like a practical goal when like looking at something like it makes it so much easier. Yeah, I mean, that's, uh, yeah. I mean, I'm, that's my, my electronics knowledge is purely uh, pragmatic. You know, I, I've learned as much as I needed to for the projects and then um, forgotten about 80% of it. So right. hopefully, hopefully some of it will come back yeah. during this. I think you also mentioned to me that like when you were younger, you were like super like trying to get into the electronics side of things, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, in the early '90s, I, I had this idea that I was uh, I was going to become like a ham radio operator, <laughs> and uh, I got I went so far as to get my license. And the way that you do that in the states is there's this archaic organization that publishes this really thick book um, with like basically anything that you would need to know in terms of electronics uh, in order to be a ham radio operator. And I still have it somewhere. It's it's sort of like a Bible, an electronics Bible, and even people who didn't get into ham radio got that book because you had to that was like you know your your introduction so i read through just enough to get my learner's permit or whatever they called it and then i never yeah i i got into computers i started programming and yeah that was that was the end of my electronics you know the bbs's and uh early early uh communications technologies like took over everything i never got i never even got a radio transceiver Oh. So I learned enough Morse code to pass the test, and then that was it. Oh, interesting. I, I also find it interesting that there's like such a huge overlap between like these two worlds of like, uh, you know, computer science and programming, and then like this kind of niche like synthesizers, also circuits, but also modular. I kind of feel like many people that I meet that are into that stuff are also programmers. Yeah, yeah, I think that's, I, I think that, you know, in the last 10, 15 years, there's also been this huge wave of people who were, you know, uh, inspired by like teensy microcontrollers and things like that. And suddenly people who felt like, oh, hardware's too hard, I can't really do that, but software I know how to do, people like me. Um, <laughs> I, I think a lot of people were kind of like, well, if all I have to do is write code for this microcontroller, 
then I can learn a little bit of electronics. Like if it's just about adding a volume knob or figuring out a preamp or something like that, maybe I can learn just enough to be able to like make a pedal. Like you, you see all these boutique pedal companies and what's inside is just, you know, it's a little computer. Um, and I think that's really interesting because that's obviously it's not the way it was 20 years ago. Right. Yeah. Like the, what I always kind of feel like when I design circuits is like, it's, it's a very different way of thinking than programming. Like in programming, you kind of have like um, unlimited resources, if you will. Right. You can like just do a bunch of things in like isolated contexts. And I feel, I feel that's like easier to reason about than a circuit where you often have one component that does like three things at once. It has like multiple responsibilities and then like having all of them present in your head as you're making changes is like a, a very different way of like, it's, it's so interconnected. I think that makes it harder. Yeah. I think that's kind of where I bailed on electronics. Actually. I just felt like, oh, you're telling me that when this thing gets hot, it does something different or like, <laughs> it's not, I can't trust the values or, you know, and with the um, computer programming, it's really a, it's a sandbox. It's a closed system. And you know, that if you tell the computer to do something, it's going to do that thing. Um, you know, the, the operating system itself takes care of all of the, the laws of physics and the, <laughs> you don't have to worry about that. Yeah. Unless, so there's like this one, uh, thing that I just encountered at work is super niche, but basically, um, I was trying to set up a bot that would do something in a Docker container and then like, uh, manipulate data somewhere else. And, uh, it always failed. But the issue was that the actual error was like contained within the Docker container that never surfaced. Like it never came, came to the actual point where the error showed up. And that was one of the moments where I was like, hey, hmm, this is kind of, this kind of feels like as if I'm building a circuit because it's like obfuscated yeah. and weird and like, ugh, whatever. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you get into, you know, timing conditions and race conditions between different things like that. So that's close. That's close. And I, whenever I have to, you know, deal with something like that, I'm suddenly like, okay, Maybe this isn't as predictable as I thought, but for the most part, for the most part, it's been uh, smooth sailing. Right. And um, so tell me a little bit about like your relationship with like uh, uh, spring reverb. Like, I think you said that you have a spring tank at home, right? Yeah, I've got one actually right here. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have all the components needed to build the circuit that we're going to be working on today, but it is brand new. I ordered it from China and I actually ordered it because I had the idea, I had done a video a while back where I put a spring reverb in a violin and I had the idea of kind of replicating that, but with a guitar just to see what that sounds like. But this would be a better use, <laughs> actually using it for its intended purpose. Also, I have a secondary possible spring reverb. Uh, one second. This over here is actually, I just got this out of the attic. Uh, a couple of years ago, I put a, a slinky, you know, the toy uh, in in here. And I put at one end, there's a piezo microphone. And uh, yeah, you can see there's like a, a jack <laughs> for plugging it in. And I was just using it for sound design. I was basically just shaking it. And uh, yeah, you can kind of hear it. It's, I, <laughs> it's making a horrible noise. Um, but then it, it occurred to me that it's basically a reverb tank. And that if we were to put like, a transducer here or even just like this right here is that that's like that piece of metal is the end of the slinky that's i've kind of pierced through the lid of this this is just a mailing tube that somebody sent to me um but yeah it occurred to me that i could try to turn that into like i don't know the world's biggest uh spring reverb or something how did it sound uh well i i it sounds very cool as a um as a uh just generator of sounds like basically like every time the 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 spring hits against it um but i haven't actually tried to, i haven't put the transducer on it yet so it it only occurred to me when you know i knew that we were going to have this uh oh. this live stream i was like maybe i can <laughs> i can build this circuit and attach it to this stupid thing i made a few years ago i think it should work oh on that yeah, on right? that on, on that note so maybe maybe you can give like an introduction on like how spring reverb works if you inform them okay uh, <laughs> we'll see um basically uh it's super super simple and i'm gonna hold this up 
uh, there are two ends. At one end, there's a transducer, which is basically like a speaker. Um, it's a thing that goes in and out uh, very, very fast at the same rate that sound propagates through the air. So uh, it's like, you know, if you're looking at a speaker and you see the middle of the speaker and it's vibrating um, because music is playing, assuming that it's music is playing, uh, that's basically what a transducer is is uh, it's just that center part that vibrates uh, and it's sending the vibrations into the spring and the spring obviously coils around many many times over and then over here at the other end we've got basically a, a pickup uh, which I, my understanding of it is it's basically exactly the same as the transducer uh, like i think that the ends are actually well no it says in and out so they must be di different somehow but to look at them they bas basically seem like they're they b both consist of copper wire that's been wrapped around a piece of metal, um, which is the same architecture uh, as like, I don't know, a power converter or, a, you know, an, an inductor coil or something. Yeah. I think like uh, to the point that they're the same, I think I remember that in physics class when I was in school, I think we were like, first our teacher explained to us how a speaker works, right? And it's like you, like you explained, you have like an, an electrical oscillation you apply that to some kind of coil that then moves the uh, uh, speaker basically back and forth and at some point he was like yeah and you can also use it as a microphone so if you just like yep. wire it up and you connect it to an amplifier you can you can talk into the speaker and it will actually you know like convert that into electrical signal and that's something i've, I've tried and yeah same thing with guitar pickups you can like um sort of sort of vibrate stuff with them it's it's a little bit iffy but uh yeah so basically that's it it you basically are injecting the sound into one end of the spring the spring is kind of causing it to reverberate back and forth and then um at the other end you're picking it up again so it's super simple actually right um and i guess that's a good point to like jump into the circuit that we'll look at today um let me switch over uh so dave like i said you like now you would need to look at the stream okay um, oh, also quick note before we jump into that. So, uh, just to the chat, like, um, today we have someone with, with us who's looking at the chat, monitoring the chat. So, um, if you have any questions, any remarks, um, put them in the chat. Um, I'll, I'll hear about it. Um, and then, uh, we can address it. So feel free to bombard us with questions. Um, Okay, so um, we'll now look at this schematic. Now, uh, the question will probably be where it's coming from, right? Because uh, in previous streams, uh, what we did was we looked at um, kind of classic designs, old designs, uh, famous designs like the Moog letter filter, for example. Um, this one is not that. So uh, this um, circuit is something that I found back in the day when I first started like doing this DIY synths, synth thing, and I didn't have any clue about um, circuit design. And this was a circuit that I found on some blog uh, by someone called, uh, I think his name is Tombola. And he had like a very nice post about like uh, how he used this circuit to build his module and uh, how it works, how it sounds, had like an audio demo, whatever. And um, at the time when I built this, like I said, I didn't have any clue how it works. Um, so I just built, uh, I just put it into a, um, into a, into a big module, which I can quickly show off here. So this is what that looks like. I used to like on my channel, I used to use my big synthesizer and this was in there. So this is like a very haphazard, like uh, strip board based circuit that is basically just like driving the, uh, the spring reverb tank. And I kind of figured like, since since that circuit worked well with my reverb tank, it makes sense to just like look at this one because we already know that there won't be any uh, compatibility issues and stuff. So that's why I picked this one. Um, and the first thing you probably think if you look at this is like, it looks kind of messy or intimidating or like sprawling. Like there seems to be a lot going on. Um, but I would actually say that that's kind of deceiving. Like, I actually don't think that this is like, if we cook it down, I don't think it's, it's actually that bad. So I think the first thing that we're going to do is, uh, just high level. I'm going to try and like isolate parts of it. 
and identify them by function. Uh, and then we'll see what we can discard for now and what the area is that we need to focus on right now. And Dave, if you have any questions during this, like just, you know, fire away. Oh, I will. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Very good. Um, all right, so let's start out. Um, I think the, the, the easiest thing to do when trying to analyze a circuit like this is like try to identify like input and output, right? And in this case, that's pretty simple because it's labeled. So we can see that um, over here, we have uh, something labeled audio in. And the symbol here is uh, just a jack socket. And uh, if you're confused by the, the arrow in the middle, like this thing, this is uh, uh, just indicating that it's a switched jack socket. But in this case, they're actually not using that functionality. So that thing is actually unconnected over here. So um, we can we can kind of ignore this little arrow. The symbol, yeah. Right, and it's 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 really just like a jack socket that like on the sleeve here is connected to ground, and then uh, this pin just gets uh, gets the signal from the tip of the jack basically. Um, and then over here, like this part that we see here, there's like a one mega ohm resistor that's going to ground. Um, that's a pattern that I keep seeing in like uh, pedal designs mostly. And I am, to be honest, I'm not entirely sure why people do it. Uh, it does work if you don't do it. Um, people do do it. So maybe in the chat, if someone has an explanation why people do it, uh, feel free to put that in there. They want to not be using Eagle. Say it again? They want to not be using Eagle. Oh, uh, apparently that's a question of who's using Eagle. Um, I have never used Eagle in my life. Uh, the only tool that I've used is uh, KiCad and... Uh, Easy EDA. And what are you using now over there? Oh, what we're using now. Um, this is just a, uh, like a, a drawing app. So this is called Adobe the, Fresco. An image editor. Okay. Yes. And then the 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 uh, the schematics is just like a image. So very low tech. Uh, okay. So input over here. And then we have the output over here. And that's clearly labeled. And uh, there's no funkiness with like a resistor going to ground. So you know, we, we, we feed the signal into here and we get our output from here. So that's probably straightforward. Uh, and then what I would suggest that we do is like we kind of try to follow the path of the signal through the circuit. So we kind of start at the input and then we can kind of see that it actually is going like in, well, it branches off and there's like three different paths, right? We have like one that goes up, we have one that goes into this capacitor and we have one that goes down here. And I would suggest that we first follow this line here down. Um, okay. Because uh, we can see here, like this is a little bit hard to see because the labels are overlapping, but you know, here it says blend. And this is like, actually like, this is like a, this is like a very like typical feature for like a reverb circuit, right? Because in the end you want to have control over the dry, dry and wet uh, uh, signal levels in the output. Because yeah. if you just have a wet signal, like if it's just uh, if it's just the the, the reverb signal, uh, it might not be all that usable. So it's great if you yeah. can just like dial in a little bit of reverb and have some of the of the dry signal in there, and that's what that's for. So I think for now, like for the operation of the circuit, like we can ignore uh, this path that's going down, um, and then up here, we can see there's a helpful label here that says EQ circuit. Um, a there's a question. Yeah. What's the question? Uh, Miguel wants to know whether the R1 is to ensure high input impedance. Oh. Okay, so to translate that, um, so high input impedance kind of means um, that there's like a, a, a high resistance um, at the input. So normally that would refer to if you have a low input impedance, then current can flow into your circuit very easily. And if it's low enough, it's actually a, sh a short circuit. So if you just simply had at the input of your circuit, a connection to ground, it's a terrible idea because obviously like it's gonna heat up, it's gonna possibly go up in flames because so much current is flowing. And so the question here is like, do they put the one mega ohm resistor here to avoid a situation like that? Um, and I don't think so because uh, to do that, it would have to be in series. So it would have to be like on the path that's going into the circuit like this. 
like only that way you can increase or decrease the input impedance of the circuit unless I'm misunderstanding the question but um, I, I, I don't think it's that maybe someone someone can chime in here in the chat um, all right so um, the EQ circuit, like I said, it's like very nicely labeled, right? It says says that it's an EQ circuit right here. And then also uh, up here, it tells us that whoop, this thing apparently is where you set the EQ, right? Um, so we can kind of presume that this entire section here is just for EQing, right? And this again makes sense because for a reverb circuit, like uh, it's kind of essential that you're able to say cut out high frequencies or cut out low frequencies because you want like a very bright reverb or you want like a very rumbly low reverb. So, mm -hmm. so that's kind yeah. of just put in there for flavor, if you will. Right? Um, and then if we go further, this is kind of, this is kind of where it gets essential, right? Because we, we could do without EQ, right? We could just say, right. yeah. let's throw that out. It's fine. We cannot do without an input socket. So the input socket is essential. Uh, the EQ, not so much. Um, and then over here, this block, this is, like I said, where it gets kind of juicy because uh, we can see that this is actually connected. That's what actually drives the spring reverb. Yeah, this is here actually connected to the to the, to the the reverb tank, right? It says here rever mm -hmm. rever reverb send, and then also here it, said, it says reverb send. And then there's like a bunch of other shit around there, but um, so we can assume that this is like where it goes into the tank. And this is probably like this, this thing here, this op amp is probably like what amplifies the signal to drive the tank. So this is again, very essential. I'm gonna call this the driver maybe. Boom. So in theory, if you didn't wanna have like a dry well, no, I guess you would say, I was just saying the the simplest possible version of this circuit that could exist is just the input and then the driver, but you would still actually need to pick up the other end, I guess. Yep. Of the, uh, okay. Yeah. That's what we're going now. So down here, we can see again, very helpful label. This says, this says recovery circuit. Um, so it's very safe to assume that this part over here is exactly that. So that will be the recovery recovery stage uh, we can also see that here right so it says reverb return and reverb return over here mm -hmm. and then we see up here this is a drive setting this thing um and yeah it makes sense because earlier like we saw oh here here this is like the blend stage right so if this is the blend stage uh, we right. can see that it You're gets mixing between those two sources and one of them is the dry signal and one of them is the wet signal. Right. The dry signal comes from the top and then the wet signal comes from below here. Comes from the bottom. Yeah. Yeah. And then this guy over here, like this thing, actually that's, I wouldn't I would actually make that part of the blend stage because uh, this seems to be a um, amplifier that basically just like takes the the wet and the dry the sum, the sum and yeah. amplifies it so we can we can out put it out there boom um boom so that's the blend stage okay and again i think i i think you you were going to say or maybe you said that i said it already like the blend stage we could also do without right like we could say eq yeah. we don't care blend we don't care so we actually only need the driver and the recovery and that's it right right and I mean, at that point, if that were our, our intent, then there wouldn't even be a connection between the top half and the bottom half other than, I guess they would share a power source. <laughs> exactly. But yeah. Right. Um, and then, like I said, actually the, the circuit is starting to look like pretty simple, right? If we cut this out and we cut this thing out, then we have, like, we, I, I think we can kind of neglect the, the input output socket because that's like, just like, you know, just interfacing. So essentially we just have this section and this section. So that's all we need to figure out basically for now to get something working. Right. And um, I, th I have a hunch that we might even be able to like cut these two blocks down even further. But um, to get there, I think we should, oh, well, there's, 
oh no, yeah, we should jump into the simulator first and talk a little bit about uh, op amps and you know how 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 you amplify a signal with an op amp. And then like the the thing that kind of puzzles me at the moment a little bit is just like the the way that this is connected to the actual spring tank because you can see here like when I when I looked at it uh, online for some research before I often saw that uh, the spring tank is like connected to the signal on 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 the on the tip of the of the connector and then to ground on the sleeve but here like we kind of connected we connect both the tip and the sleeve to uh, to our op amp, like to this feedback loop. But I guess we'll get there in a second. Yeah. Um, right. Okay. Let me jump over to the simulator. And Dave, you have to give me a little heads up into how basic should we go? So should we quickly go through like super, super basic. basic? So we should start with like resistors and capacitors, right? Uh, I mean, I know I know what resistors and capacitors are, but then after that, um, the, once we get into the op amp, I'm, it's just a complete black box to me. I have no idea what it's doing. Okay. Um, good. Then. Okay. Then let's just start with like a very, very, very simple uh, op amp circuit, basically. So since what we're trying to do here is amplify a signal, uh, I'm quickly going to run through the basics of how you do that. So we're going to assume that we have a, oh, that's the wrong power source again. Let's assume that we have an audio signal, like a very like simple one. We have a triangle wave and the triangle wave is very quiet. So it's, uh, Set this to, to 100 millivolts peak to peak. Uh, like in the oscilloscope down here, it looks it looks huge, but like this, this would be very quiet. This is like one tenth of line level. And now let's assume that we want to like blow this up to like in a Eurex synthesizer, you want it to be like 10 volts peak to peak. So that will be times 100 would, the, would be the amplification factor. And how you can do it with an op amp is in something called the non-inverting um, configuration and the idea there is um, you can you can do two separate modes of amplification with a, with an op amp one is non-inverting one is inverting and that only refers to like the the phase of the, the wave flipping. yeah right? so if you did it inverting it would just like flip it on its head non-inverting it's just uh, staying the same and we'll do it non-inverting because um, just quickly to show this, like in this circuit here for the driver, we also uh, use the op amp in the non-inverting mode, and we can we can tell because the signal is being fed. Whoops, the signal is being fed into the non-inverting input. That's like the one with a plus. Right. And, and if okay. you see, if you see that, you always know how oh, it's non-inverting. If it's going okay. if it's going into the minus uh, minus label thing, it's always inverting. All right, so we're going to replicate this. We're going to put this in here. Um, okay, and already something is happening. Like if we try and um, wait, let me let me put this here. I think it's a bit clearer, like what this belongs to. And let me maybe bump the frequency a bit. I think we can bump it even more, just so that like multiple. Uh, wave cycles fit into the oscilloscope. And then we're going to look at the output. Like so. Oh no. Boom. Okay. And you'll notice that, interestingly, uh, this turns the triangle wave into a square wave, right? And yeah. it's actually the same frequency. So it's like the same it's the same wave but in a different shape and you can also see that it's way way louder so over here you can see that this is, this is a it's actually 200 millivolts peak to peak and this is now 30 volts peak to peak and uh basically what's happening here is that um the op amp just naturally like has, has a huge amount of gain and if we take 
a signal that's even as quiet as this and apply it to the input, um, the op amp will basically just like overreact to like any time the input voltage goes slightly above zero volts or slightly below zero volts. It will like instantly kind of like jump to the highest level it can put out or drop to the lowest level it can put out. Okay. So that's just like, uh, like in here, let me check in the simulator. Yeah, so in the simulator, the gain is actually times 100,000. So that's really insanely high. I'm not sure if like with real world components, it would be the same thing. But it's like, use this way, it's just like an insanely high gain amplifier, if you will. Okay. So do we need to do something else to kind of mitigate that so that it brings it down to a, a normal level? Exactly. That's what we need to do. And the simplest thing that we can actually do is, um, so like in any case, what you do is like you uh, use negative feedback. So you use negative feedback to calm it down, if you will. And the simplest way to do this is just simply to connect the inverting input to the output of the op amp. And you can see how, how that immediately like made it like behave, right? So now it's actually identical. So this signal, this waveform is the same amplitude as the one on the left. And the question is now, why? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, uh, right, so I'm going to try to make this very, very basic. Okay, so um, you're going to notice that the op amp has two inputs, right? So it's the plus level one, the minus level one. Sure. And that's, yeah. it's, it's kind of puzzling, right? Because normally you would expect well, an amplifier, if it's just supposed to blow up a signal, it should just have one input and one output, right? And then some kind of dial or whatever to like set the level of amplification. Uh, with these op amps, it's like, it's, it's tricky because they do provide this kind of methodology of like dialing the gain down, but it's like via this two input approach. And the idea here is that an op amp is uh, what we call a differential amplifier. So what it will do is it doesn't, it doesn't think of, uh, or it, it doesn't operate in just having like one input and amplifying that one input, but instead it says, I'm gonna get two inputs and I'm gonna operate on the difference between them basically. And how that works in practice here is that, um, the op amp will always look at its two inputs and then it will measure the voltages at both inputs separately and it will then subtract the voltage at the inverting input so that would be the one up here from the voltage at the non-inverting input so if we okay. if we we can actually like set this up in a very clear way so if we just instead of giving it an oscillation and doing the feedback thing if we just give it um, two constant voltages so in this case five volts and then we say show me the voltage here you can see that it outputs zero volts because it's going to be zero yeah five minus five is zero right and if we drop this down to four then you can see okay so it's not it's not one right so it's not like, oh yeah, five, five minus four is one, so I'm gonna output one. The thing here is that, as I said before, the op amp operates on the difference between the two voltages. So what it's gonna do, it's gonna say, okay, let me subtract this, five minus four is one, and then I'm gonna multiply this by my gain, in this case, 100,000. So outcome of that is 100,000, and then it's gonna try to push out 100,000 volts. The issue is that, in the simulation, we only give it 15 volts as the maximum uh, voltage it can operate with. So that's just okay. like the voltage that you supply it with. So if you have a power supply that puts out nine volts, 12 volts, 15 volts, whatever, that's what kind of sets the limit. And obviously like the, the op amp can't like generate voltage, like it's not gonna you know, create right. that out of thin air. So it's gonna settle for 15 here. That makes sense? Yeah, it does. Perfect. Mm. Right, and now the um, the uh, the kicker with this kind of setup is that uh, you you could now ask, well, if if this is the case, right? If the two input voltages are equal, and then we get zero volts, then why do we even have an output signal, right? Because if it 
if if input and output are the same, which they are, shouldn't we get zero? But this is where it kind of gets a little bit twisted because uh, that's kind of the nature of feedback. So the 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 thing here is if we try and uh, doesn't work. Ah, no, of course it won't show up in here. I'm stupid. Okay, so yeah, in this case, it's actually true. Like five minus five is zero. Like if it's if it's exactly five on both inputs, then 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 that's the case. But in the case of this kind of feedback setup, the um, situation is that let's say you have. Uh, we can also test this again with this method. So we're going to apply five volts over here, and then we are going to set the scale here to microvolts right and there you can see it so with this feedback um, you're never going to get five volts at the output because as we said earlier if both inputs were actually sitting at five volts then the output must be zero because you know you subtract the two if they if they're identical you get zero um, but this won't actually work because if the voltage here was zero then you know you would subtract zero from five and the output would be huge again. And right. so what happens is that the op amp kind of settles for this value that is just like a teeny tiny bit below five volts. So that if you now subtract this value from five volts, it's a tiny value. And then you uh, multiply this by the huge gain and then you get to this value basically. Does that make sense? It does, but only because you're telling me. <laughs> I have to take your word for it. Yeah. So it actually, like when working with this stuff, like it's it's easiest to just like not think about like this teeny tiny difference between the input and the output and just like think of it in terms of, okay, if I set up an op amp like this and I just apply the negative feedback straight up, like without anything in the feedback path, then the outcome is that input and output will be identical. Right. And this is now a good like place to start because um, we could probably, I'm not entirely sure, but we could probably drive our spring tank just with this thing. Because the only thing that I think we're really concerned about when driving the transducer inside the spring tank is that we're able to provide it enough current. And the, the problem here is that um, whatever we use as our signal source um, might not have uh, a low output impedance. So what that means is um, you could have a device, oh, whoops, wrong button. You could have a device that internally has, I don't know, let's say 10K worth of resistance in between the output uh, the output and the output socket. So that means that um, you cannot draw a lot of current from this without distorting the signal. So I can I can quickly illustrate this. Like let's say we have this we have this uh, signal source, and then we have a 10k resistor, and then sure. we're interested in the signal that's coming out of here, and right now because we're not pulling current from this because this is just monitoring the voltage like there's nothing flowing you can see that because these yellow dots they're not moving so we get our nice like 200 millivolts peak to peak signal it's a nice uh, triangle wave everything's great but now we can imagine that maybe our circuit actually does draw current and our transducer will do that like the transducer will pull current from the source in order to actually move the spring, right? To, to spring into action and, and get the, the mechanical oscillation in there. And we can simulate that by just like putting a resistor to ground here. And we can see that this like, dr like dramatically drops the, the volume of the input signal. Like it makes it super, super quiet just because there's a path to ground here. Like there's a, we're pulling current through the 10K resistor and this means that uh, we affect the actual waveform. So that's, okay. no, that's no good. So if we do that, like we might not get uh, a, like a very like loud signal from the right. spring tank. And if we instead, if we put the, the, the op amp in here, the buffer, 
uh, if we now put in a like the same one kilo ohm resistor to ground then we can see that the output is unaffected and that's because um, the op amp in this configuration is what we call a buffer so it just takes the signal and it, it creates a copy that is um, that is able to provide a lot of current for whatever uh, circuit we connect it to. So it's kind of like, uh, what's a good analogy for this? <laughs> it's it's just like a, a, I don't have one. It's just it's just a building block that's able to supply current while keeping the voltage the same. If that makes sense. Yeah, it does. Okay, good. Mm. Okay, my, my, my point, right, my point was that I, th I, I think that we might even be able to, like, drive the spring tank just with this. Just with okay. taking the signal, putting it into an amplifier, and then connecting that to the spring tank. But now the only thing that's kind of puzzling me is that in the schematic, you know, like I said earlier, we can see that the... Uh, the tip um, of the connector that goes into the spring tank is connected here and the sleeve is connected over here. And you can see it's inside this feedback loop, right? Like this part here is the actual feedback loop. Right. And so that's confusing to me, but... So both both connections to the, to the tank are within that loop. Yeah, so if you, if you imagine that you have the transducer can draw the transducer. Let's say this is a transducer. You have one connection over here. You have one connection over here. What I saw previously online was that people connected it like this. So they would connect the tip to here, and then they would connect the bottom just to ground like this. And then I assume that current just like flows in this direction and through the transducer. And as the current gets more or less, it kind of like causes the spring to vibrate. But in our example here, oh, this is getting very messy. Let me clean this up. So in our example here, like I said, we have the tip connected here. We have the sleeve connected here. So if I draw the transducer again, that will be like tip here and then sleeve here. I, I have a theory. So I think maybe the, the, the transducer acts as a resistor. So basically, this is, you know, like a resistor just resists the flow of current. So sure. yeah. uh, uh, it kind of slows it down. And I think because the transducer does work, right? Like it, it uses the current to do something. So I'm assuming that that would also mean that it acts like a resistor. Like it, it, it inhibits the flow of electrons, if you will, right? Sure, yeah. And so that would make sense because there, there now is, if I draw this in a different way, like if we just say it's here. And then we have the transducer and then it goes like this. Um, then we just have like a resistor in the feedback path that current is like passing through. And the reason why I think this is because like this thing here is puzzling to me. Like they put a capacitor in the feedback path here. It's very small. And what that does is like a very small capacitor will kind of block um, oscillations of, of like uh, lower frequencies. And actually we can simulate this. Let me jump over here. So let's say that we take our little buffer circuit here. We remove this thing. And then uh, we're just gonna add what they added. So I'm going to add a small capacitor. So this would be a, Zero point, no, zero point zero one microfarad. That's not it. So I think it would be ten nano, and then we have a two K resistor. And then on the other hand, on the other hand, end we have a uh, six hundred sixty ohms resistor to ground and yeah here you can see what i mean so i'm not seeing your hold on i'm not seeing your uh oh i didn't switch i'm sorry boom can you see now 
Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, so you can see on the left, like it's a triangle wave that we put in. And on the right, you can see that now we have like a weird sine wave out of it, right? Which, uh, I mean, by itself, is kind of cool. So we have like it's a, very cool. We have a sine wave converter. Um, but it's not really what you want, right? You don't, you don't want to send a distorted signal into the spring tank. Maybe you want to do it. Maybe it sounds cool. We could try that. But um, yeah. <laughs> like this is, this, is, this is a little bit odd because I would expect like the driver to be like faithful to the input signal. And this is like where this idea comes in for me that maybe uh, the transducer here is acting as a resistance because if we jump in here and I make a little room for us, boom. And then I just like test this hypothesis by putting a uh, resistor here. Right across it. Yeah, then you can see all of a sudden, like this uh, is looking normal again, right? So my assumption is that this section here, like this capacitor and this resistor, like I think they're just like f for some reason, like filtering the signal in some way. But this would work without them. Like if we would take them out, it looks the same. Probably it's like in some way cleaning up the signal, but I, I kind of see like a, a, a possibility for us here again to like just like cut down on the complexity of the circuit. Yeah, and I'm actually not sure what like the the uh, what the impedance of a transducer is. Uh, maybe again, someone in the chat can enlighten us. Um, so you know, I would be guessing like judging from the value of this resistor, which is like very very uh, very small one. So 660 ohms is like very very low. Uh, I would assume that the uh, impedance from the uh, spring tank is like also pretty low because otherwise like if this was very high let's assume this was 100k then uh the signal would be insanely loud so there might be an answer in the chat, in the chat. what is it <laughs> so christopher venter says uh the input impedance is in a range of like 80 ohms to 1.9k that's actually that's very, low. very low so you said 80k no, 80 ohms? Yeah, 1.9K. All right. So if it was 80 ohms, then the signal would be really quiet, actually. Oh, that's almost one to one. Interesting. And 1.9K, you said? Yeah. Okay, 1K9. Okay. I'm looking at my uh, the reverb tank that I got from AliExpress to see uh, if there's any specs on it. It doesn't look like there are any specs. All right. Oh, let me check mine. Give me a second. Uh, oh no, there are, there are, um, two, 2k, 2.2k. Oh, 2.2k. That's good. Okay. Let's put this in here. Good. Okay. Uh, and yeah, just to explain like the, 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 you know, the way that this works. So this is like a very classic, uh, non-inverting amplifier. Like what we had before was like, just like a non-inverting buffer. And this is a non-inverting amplifier. And basically, uh, how it works is we saw that previously, if we apply the the output signal to the input uh, to the inverting input signal just like straight up, uh, we had like a gain um, a gain of one, right? We had like uh, two hundred millivolts peak to peak input, two hundred millivolts peak to peak output. And if we want to increase the gain, what you basically have to do is like we have to make um, we have to make it harder for the op amp to get the voltage at the inverting input the same level as it is at the non-inverting input. And we do that with a voltage divider. So if we, um, if we draw this in a kind of slightly different way, so I'm going to go over here, I'm going to put a 2K2 resistor here. I'm going to put a 660 ohms resistor to ground like this. And then I'm just going to put in like a static thing. And I'm going to put an output over here. Then we can see that the voltage is divided down. Like that's why they call it a voltage divider. Um, so basically, anytime you see like this sort of setup where you have like an input connected to a resistor, and then after that, there's resistance to ground, 
you know that they are scaling down the input voltage. And in our case, it's by a factor of uh, five. Is that how you say that? No, factors are only for multiplication, right? I'm not, I'm not good at maths. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so the, 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 <laughs> sorry, Dave? No, I, I don't know. Right. Divisor. Divisor. Something. Cool. Something, Something like, like that. Right. I don't know. But I mean, yeah, the essential part is just like we have five volts here and we have less than five volts over here. And so basically it's the same thing that's happening here. So it's, it's like drawn differently, but also you have an input signal that goes through the 2K2 resistor. And then you have a, a 660 ohms resistor to ground. So the voltage at this node will also be scaled down in relation to the voltage at this node. And as we saw earlier, um, the op amp will try to, we can say, make the output, um, no, make the voltage at the inverting input equal to the input at the non-inverting uh, input. And now in order to do that, it has to work harder. So you can see here, it has to provide five times the input voltage to get uh, to the same level it got to before, right? So if it wants to move this node to five volts, uh, to one volt, it has to push out five volts actually. And so that way we force it just to make the signal louder, if you will. Okay. Right, and then I think like we will try this in a second. The issue is like we still need to like set up the recovery circuit, but I think that this should be enough to drive the the spring tank, which kind of seems anticlimactic. But I think this is it. That's, that's all there is to it, basically. <laughs> all right, um, let's jump over to the pad again and let's look at the recovery circuit then. So over here. We again have you know, an op amp. We again have it in a non-inverting setup, right? Because you can see that the uh, reverb return, they call it here, is connected to the non-inverting input. So that leads us to assume that's again a non-inverting uh, amplifier setup. Um, we said earlier that this is like a, a drive setting, whatever. So probably we can also ditch this. Like we don't, for now, we don't need to care about the drive. Um, one thing that's a little bit puzzling to me over here is that the sleeve is connected to this node, which is connected to ground. But maybe that's not so puzzling. Maybe it's, uh, it's, it's just drawn in a weird way. Like, I don't think that like whenever you see like multiple things connected to ground, it doesn't mean they're associated, but they drew it here in a way as if the sleeve has any effect on this kind of uh, feedback path of the, of the op amp, but I don't think it has. Like they just both go to ground and they drew it in a weird way, but you know, I don't think this is uh, really meaningful. Okay. Yeah. Um, and Otherwise, so it, would have been, it would have made more sense just uh, in terms of following the circuit if they had just drawn R8 as going to ground and then drawn the sleeve as going to ground separately, even though. I think so. I Yeah, I mean, both of these resistors actually go to ground, right? So R8 and R9, they both go to ground. Um, though I'm a little bit, I'm a little bit puzzled as to why they would both go to ground. We'll find out in a second, the simulator, I guess. Um, but yeah, I think this capacitor and this capacitor up here, I think they're again, just there to kind of filter the sound. Like whenever you see capacitors in and around the feedback paths of op amps, it's usually like some sort of filtering, either high pass or low pass filtering or whatever. Sometimes it's also used to like get rid of like power supply noise or like anything unwanted that creeps in. Um, so probably we can like kind of dismiss it for now. Yeah. But I wonder what the origin of that was, if it was actually this, uh, something that was born of an actual problem that was solved or if it was more just like, uh, I don't know, best practices or something. It's a very good question. It's, um, it's something that I, that I, that I see a lot where it's like um, people will 
kind of adhere to a best practice just like because it is a best practice but there isn't actually a problem to fix so that's actually you see that a lot with circuits because i kind of think like in programming it's like easier to to point this stuff out because it's like you can reason about it easily like hey do we need really need to i don't know do what's a good example check for values that are out of bounds if we've already done that in a previous function or something like that yeah right 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 yeah yes and here it's like because because the the component could be doing multiple things at once like you you don't want to fuck with it you don't want to take it out and be like oh now it breaks everything but we'll 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 see in a second um okay so i will try to set this up in the in the simulator and then we'll see where we go uh Okay, you can see the simulation, right? Yep. Okay, yep. Perfect. Good. Let me copy this guy. And then I will add a, well, this is now a little bit tricky. Uh, if I jump back to the pad, like I think I'm gonna try and, 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 and conceptualize like this path here again as a transducer and so just like in our simulation we're going to just use a resistor again so i will set it up like this um, we have a path going over here we have a 2k resistor over here oh i didn't switch i didn't switch now i switched okay so 2k resistor down here I'm gonna add another 2K2 because that's what you said your spring tank has, Dave. Yep. And then I'm gonna add a, well, it's for now we're gonna add the capacitor, but this is actually a huge one. So it specifies in the schematic that it's supposed to be at 22 microfarads. That's actually, that's gi gigantic. So in terms of audio, 22 microfarads is kind of like as if it's not there. Because just to explain quickly, like if you put a capacitor in the path of an audio signal, so you route an audio signal through a capacitor, um, what happens is like the bigger the capacitor, um, the more of the audio signal can just like go right through it as if it's, you know, as if it's not even there. As it gets smaller, the capacitor kind of fills up quicker. And so as the signal oscillates, um, the capacitor kind of fills up and drains and it runs into its maximum capacity. And so then it starts to alter the shape of the waveform. But uh, with the capacitor as huge as this, like it wouldn't wouldn't do much. So it leads me to believe that it's like trying to filter or like some sort of maybe noise coming from power. the spring tank or something. Yeah, or power, some power fluctuations or something. Right. I so, don't know. So for now, I'm just going to kill it. And we're just going to add in the, what's the 68 ohms. Again, that's like almost nothing. <laughs> so it won't do much. Um, right. And then all of these nodes over here are connected to ground. Let me quickly show this here. So yeah, this goes to ground, this goes to ground, and then this goes to ground. I'm going to draw this like they did. Boom, and boom and boom and uh, then we want to also do something to the feedback path because right now uh, we have like if we don't have this path then again we have an op amp without feedback and that means it would just like again just thrash against the the voltage limits and just horribly distort the signal so right. now we have to figure out like if we if we don't care about the drive circuit for now, I think. So I think we can go really simple and just turn this into a buffer again. And I think that because you can see this component here is a potentiometer, which is a variable resistor. So as you turn the knob on that thing, uh, it changes like the amount of resistance uh, in the path. And we can see that they just like, they just plopped it in straight, straight, straight up. And so if you turn it to the minimum setting, this will actually be zero ohms. So it's just like a straight connection. And then 
the setup becomes familiar, right? Because if we have a straight connection between the output and the inverting input, it's just a buffer. It just passes through. Right. No. Oh, it does. Yeah. It does. And then the op amp just it just reproduces the signal at the the input. And exactly. It. Yeah. Um. Okay. So what is that capacitor that's above the drive um, drive knob? I have a very strong feeling that this is like kind of filtering uh, the signal because this is very small. So this is a one nanofarads capacitor, <laughs> and uh, in combination with a uh, with a relatively big resistance like the 50k down here, uh, what will happen? I th oh, I'm always bad like with filters in feedback paths of op amps, but I think that this is going to be a, a low pass. So it's gonna like as you increase the drive, it's gonna like shave off some of the high end to make it less less harsh. We can try that in a second. Um, all right, so let's jump over to the simulator again, and I'm going to set this up as a straight up buffer like this. Okay, and disappointingly, nothing happens because you know we don't have any input signal. Um, <laughs> Uh, all right, so I think probably it's not wise to to conceptualize the transducer like this because I think the signal would kind of come from the transducer. It would like flow out of it, basically. So I think it's probably more accurate if we think about it like... Oh, this is going to be ugly. I don't want to reorganize the entire thing, so I'm just going to put it like this. Um, so we can just imagine that this just gets the signal from up here. So, you know, that's what we put into the coil, uh, the transducer. And then that's what feeds it in here. And then we would have... Well, maybe... Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reorganize this because this is a little bit... This is a little bit ugly. So let me take this thing, put it over here, and then I'm gonna route this to the fake transducer. And then we're going to add an output over here. Oops. And we're gonna add this to scope. And uh, oh wonder, it's just a, it's just a triangle wave. And all right, so now I'm wondering if maybe all this stuff, like all the, the these resistances and you know all of this, maybe we could even just get away with like not doing that because all that this does right now, I think, um is reducing actually the volume of the input. So we can see here that this signal is actually like almost one volt peak to peak, but then what's what's being put out here is just like 400 millivolts peak to peak. So I'm assuming that like this kind of circuitry in combination with the potentiometer and the capacitors like are just for the drive functionality. So I would propose that we get rid of all of this stuff Bye bye. Are you in the simulator? Also now on the breadboard, and we start building it, and basically just saying like, "Oh, I'm in the simulator." Oh, sorry. Um, right. So what I was saying is, I'm proposing that we just get rid of like all this additional stuff that we had at the recovery circuit, like all the additional resistors, capacitors, potentiometer, and let's just let's just build this as a buffer, and then let's just see what happens. Is that cool? Sounds, Sounds good. All right, cool. Because in theory, if if the first part is working, we should even be able to hear. I I think you can you can hear the reverb tank like very slightly. It's like a little bit audible even in the room. Yes, we should be able to hear it. Yeah. All right, then let's switch over to the breadboard. And Dave, you said that you couldn't find a TL074, right? Yeah. <laughs> I thought I thought I had one, and then when I went to look, I did not. So, I'm. I'm watching. <laughs> it's actually kind of like my, I think, like I have a bunch of chips here, but like the TL074 is just like the 
most common one like if i like dig through my uh through my through my stash it's just like every second chip is is one of those i love them <laughs> all right so here you can see the chip in question this is a tl74 um this is basically just like four op amps in a, t in a single chip um they are all identical um they all do the same thing they all have like a an inverting input a non-inverting input an output and then the chip also has like a pin for uh, positive, uh, the positive supply rail and one for the negative supply rail. And one kind of pitfall like with these, uh, with these is that they need a dual power supply is what we call it. And a dual power supply is basically different from your regular everyday power supply because your regular everyday power supply has only a positive rail and a ground rail. Um, so if you have, for example, a nine volt power supply then on the one side it's nine volts on the other side it's zero volts um, but um, for um, op amps or at least this type of op amp uh, that's not really good enough um, because the op amp expects to have um, a voltage above zero volts above ground and a voltage below zero volts so below ground and the reason for that is because well, i'm not sure if they were made with this in mind but you usually use op amps to like process audio and audio actually swings across the, the zero volts line. So uh, with a synthesizer, for example, if you have an oscillator, it will swing between plus five and minus five volts. So it will swing, you know, uh, above and below ground. And op amps are often used to like buffer audio or amplify audio or whatever. And so the op amp needs to be able to operate kind of above and below ground. And that's why it needs like both rails if you will and it's a little tricky because dual power supplies aren't really like that common anymore um i think a lot of stuff is nowadays just done with like single-sided power supplies and so you you actively like have to look for a dual power supply you can also like frankenstein one together from like two regular ones you can like make them be a dual power supply but that's a little bit wasteful so do do, do you have one uh, I don't have a dual power supply. I, I mean, I, I think that a Eurorack has has a dual yep. in it. So I guess that would be my plan. Right. Yeah, that's actually like when I started out, it was actually like a huge hurdle because all the circuits I found were calling for a dual power supply. And I, I was just starting out. I was like, I just have a battery. <laughs> I don't so actually, does that like preclude, you know, anybody using an op amp in like, I don't know, the... Uh, a pedal like a guitar pedal or something like that because the guitar pedal is pretty much the standard is nine volts and it's not a dual power supply presumably yep and they do like a very horrible thing um they basically they bias everything up so they basically say okay let me take for example the signal coming from a guitar and let me push let me put uh, uh put like an offset voltage to that so i'm going to push that above ground level so that it swings above and below like 4.5 volts if they have a nine volt power supply. And they're gonna do all the operation, whatever they wanna do with that kind of bias to it. And then in the end, they just and like- And then subtract it back. Yes, they push it back down. And it's uh, I, it's really involved, no, it's not involved, but it's just, just, just like this annoying extra step that you have to do. So I respect uh, pedal builders for that patience. <laughs> But you can also, like what you can do, um, if you have like two, two batteries, you can connect them in a way that they uh, actually act as a dual power supply. So if you have two 9-volt batteries, you can make them be a plus, uh, plus 9 volts ground and minus 9 volts power supply. Okay. Yeah. By co connecting the positive to ground and on one and the negative to ground on the other and then... So it's it's a it's a little bit bit kind of intuitive. So you basically um, wait. Let me check if I have nine volt batteries here somewhere. Uh, oh yeah, here they are. So whoop, I'm gonna switch over to the this view. So you have two nine volt batteries, right? And they have both a positive and a negative uh, pin, basically. And what you do is you connect positive on one side, uh, this one, to negative on the other side. And then the combination of those two becomes your ground terminal. 
And then the positive on this battery would be your plus nine volts and the negative on this battery would be your minus nine volts actually. Okay. No, but yeah. I can't explain to you why that is. Like I have no idea. <laughs> All right, so let's try to set this up. Uh, like I said, I have my TLO74 over here. I am going to put this in. Um, for anyone maybe following along at home, keep in mind, always keep in mind that these are very, 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 very sensitive to like, uh, if you connect them to power in the wrong direction. So if you um, connect negative power to the left side and positive power to the right side, it's gonna burn, it's gonna smell bad, uh, you're gonna be sad, it's not good. So always the positive rail has to go to the left side of the op-amp and the negative rail has to go to the right side of the op-amp. It's actually like every time I give a workshop, that's like the thing that happens. So I always bring like spare chips because you always smell, like the smell of like burning chips. And actually the last workshop I gave, someone managed to like melt the breadboard like they connected it incorrectly and they didn't notice. And then oh, wow. it, it actually like, it, it started like sinking into the breadboard. That was kind of intense. Yeah. There are two questions. Uh, first question is, is the stream gonna be recorded? Yep. yep. Okay, and the second question, uh, uh, Bornock wants to know, are transducers and spring reverb piezoelectric or do they use coils of wire like a speaker is it different on either end of the spring reverb tank it's a very good question dave i don't know <laughs> <laughs> um we were we <laughs> we were we were wondering that earlier about whether or not they were different on either end of the the tank i mean i i, I believe that they are different uh because it's labeled in and out and they would only do that if there was some difference. And you can also see uh, structurally here, there's a slight difference. Um, this one has like a, they both have coils. They both have copper wire, wire coils, but this one has a long metal plate. So I guess this is the output. And you can kind of see that, hard to, hard to see though. I mean, they're extremely similar architectures. I, I, but yeah, some subtle difference that I, I, I can't speak to. I also like when I looked at mine, I also had the impression that it, it looks like a, like if I remember correctly from physics class, like you make an electromagnet by just like taking a wire and just like uh, wrapping or wrapping it around a thing a thousand times, right? And that's what that looks like to me. Was that all, Nick? All right. Um, okay, so just for some background. So this cable here that I have, um, this is, uh, I don't know how, how, how you Americans call it. We call these uh, chinch, chinch cable. Do you have a name for these? Which which cables? So the, the I think on the stream you should be able to see, or this connector rather. Oh, RCA connectors? RCA, all right. So yeah, these these are the ones that or, I have. Or phono, phono connectors, uh, usually RCA. All right. So these are the ones that are like on my spring tank, I guess also on yours. Same, yeah. All right. Um, so yeah, I, I, I pillaged this from my big synthesizer. Like I had to like kind of, uh, I had to like break it open and then like take these out. And cause I, I didn't, I didn't have any more of these because I never used them. Like, but uh, yeah, I have them, which is good. And right now I'm connecting it, connecting them like to the op amp in the way that we uh, set it up in the simulator. So that would be, the tip of this guy goes to the, um, oh, that's actually incorrect. Let me check that. So the tip goes to the inverting input. That would be this position here. And then the sleeve goes to the output of the op amp over here. And then the idea is that the signal basically like, uh, leaves through the output of the op amp goes through the transducer which acts as a resistor and then comes back to the inverting input basically and uh, then remove this Ugh. so again tip inverting input sleeve output 
And then we will need a 600 ohms or 660 ohms resistor. Let me see if I have that exact value, but I have a hunch that we can probably use something close enough and we'll be fine. So this is 680, 680 should be okay. Uh, do you, do you breadboard, Dave? Sometimes, yeah. Hmm. Do you ever have trouble with, um, so there's some breadboards where the, these power rails, they're cut in the middle and they indicate that by like uh, cutting these red and blue lines. Do you, did, you, did you ever encounter that? No, I've never had that. Um, but yeah, I do have a lot of different weird breadboards that I ordered from overseas and they all seem to have something strange about them. Sometimes the plus and the minus are mixed up or yeah, there's a, always something odd. It's so weird. It's like such a like very like, it's such a like finished concept, right? The breadboard. It's like so like there's no need to do like weird shit about it because it's like it works. Yeah. But then people like for some reason, like they just do. It's absolutely bizarre. All right. So this should actually already be our, this should already be our uh, driver. Yep. It's, it's really that's just it. the cable, the op amp and the resistor and that's it. Uh, and then we want to set up the recovery thing, which um, I just need one jumper to make it into a buffer. Wait, where are my jumpers? Here. Mm. Okay. Are you um, are you into drum machines, Dave? Yes. What's your favorite? Ooh, that's tough. <laughs> <laughs> I um, uh, I was messing actually with a drum brute impact, um, the other, from Arturia the other day, which right. I really liked. But I, I I don't know favorite. That's tough. The the impact is kind of like the the the, the little brother of the normal drum brute of the regular of the regular drum brute, but it's also like different. Yeah. Which is confusing. So it's like they changed some things when they released it. Yeah. I think it's, I think it sounds really great, but I, um, I wish it had automation of some sort. Oh, it doesn't. I think that's kind of, no, no, it doesn't. It's, it's basically like you, you can, you can tweak the knobs as it's playing back, uh, but it doesn't automate any of the parameters. Um, so yeah, it's too bad because the actual sound is wonderful, but like, the first thing I reached for is this, like uh, the first thing I wanted was to be able to automate it. So. Yeah. I think I remember, uh, like when it came out, like people talking about how the kick was like more, more powerful than on the main drum brute. Yeah. Maybe like punch, it, it, punching. definitely the kick, the kick is great. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting because like, I'm, uh, currently like I'm in the, in the process of like finishing a new video on like, a uh, on an analog kick drum. And I have, I have had like some struggles with it because I based it on the core principle of like a Howard 606 and an 808 kick works. Um, but I like for my taste, like those kicks are a little bit uh, soft sounding, like not really like punchy aggressive enough. And then I tried to like kind of brute force like a 909 type like pitch envelope in there, you know, to get like this nice punchy. Uh, yeah. techno-ish sound and at first like it didn't work at all uh, and at some point I, I found like a like a little hack that made it work and it's like a, it's like a very tiny change to the architecture um, but it's interesting that that made it work because the 909 is like the kick is entirely like it's an entirely different concept so it's not even uh, in the same it doesn't speak the same language um, right but uh, yeah, so it worked. I'm very happy with that. Um, okay, there's a question. Uh, Lord, Z Lord Zeffo would like to know whether you make your own jumpers or you ordered them. Oh, uh, I order them? No, I didn't order them. Actually, I buy them uh, from a shop here in Berlin because as with breadboards, um, the problem with jumpers is that if you order them, you are bound to like get uh, bad products. At least, at least in my experience, like a lot of the stuff on Amazon, a lot of the stuff that you get from 
uh, I don't know, even Mauser, like you get, like jumpers that are super soft and they're super malleable and then it's really difficult to plug them into the breadboard, especially if the breadboard is also low quality and it's like very tough to put something into these holes. And that combination is just terrible. And so there's like this small store here in Berlin that I like to go to and buy my parts. And the jumpers that they have, they are like really, really sturdy. They're really nice, but they're also kind of expensive. But I think it's it's worth it. Did you, um, Dave, did you order jumpers online ever? Yeah, I ordered, I think I ordered three or four different sets. And uh, yeah, they vary greatly. <laughs> but uh, yeah. It's kind of crazy, like how, how they can get this wrong. Because again, it's like such a basic product. There's like one thing that it needs to be good at. And if it's not good at that, then it's like... What are you doing? I just realized that I forgot to set up the input to the circuit. So basically I was, I was going to ask about that. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, I just need to add like a little jumper over here uh, that I then connect to just like a regular jack socket that I soldered a cable to. And then I will just take my drum machine and just put this in here. <clears throat> okay. Missing an adapter. All right. Good. So now we have the signal coming in. Uh, we are feeding it into the spring tank. And then we are getting the output back from over here. And this is again, just, just a buffer. So it's just buffering the output from the, from the output, the output from the output of the output from the spring tank. And then I'm just going to plug this thing into my audio interface. Whoops. And let me turn this up a little bit. And all right. So first test is always, I'm going to turn on my power supply. My power supply has something called uh, an overcurrent protection. And so if I messed up, it will make like a clicking noise and then it will just shut itself off. So uh, let's test this now. That seemed okay. Okay, so theoretically, like since this is already connected to the interface, like if I now uh, punch the spring tank, we should probably hear something. Let's see. Oh. You hear that? Very nice. Cool. All right. Then let's try and turn on the drum machine. There's a question in your head. Oh, there's a question. Then first, first, first do first the question. question. Uh, George wants to know, is there any downside to using two regulators to make split power supply by tying ground to ground on one and then tying the positive output of the other to ground and using its ground out as negative tail. So you want to use two voltage regulators. I didn't quite get the setup part, but so my assumption is you're taking a single sided power supply and you're running that into two separate regulators and then you're kind of tricking them into producing a negative rail. So the idea here would be to split the rail. Nick, did it say something about splitting? Uh, yes, it says, uh, no, it doesn't say anything about splitting. <laughs> it says uh, to make a split power supply by tying ground to ground on one. All right. I'm not quite sure I get the, I get the setup. Nick, can you turn off your microphone? Thank you. Uh, I'm not sure I get quite get the setup. Could you, um, could I maybe ask you to uh, set that up real quick in the simulator and send the link in the chat and then we can have a look at it. That would be great. In the meantime, let's uh, try to get the reverb thing going. All right. Well, I, I hear a hi-hat, but not much more than that, I would say. Ow. The, oh, there we go. It was it was short circuiting basically. 
Oh, so I'm, oh, I'm surprised that this did not blow up the chip. Yeah, that sounds like reverb to me. Sure does. Let me try and turn on the volume a little bit. Because the, you know, you can hear the, the little, uh, I don't know how to describe that. Like usually like when you drive a reverb tank too hard, like if the signal is too loud that you feed in, you get like these, you hear the springs, right? It sounds like very uh, yeah. metallic. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so, so I wonder, like the signal going in isn't very loud, but you still get this effect, which is very interesting. Oh, I can see the springs vibrate actually. Let me pull this over here. Oh, what happened? <laughs> uh, okay, let me split these two up because they keep touching and then it's just short circuiting. See the vibrate, right? And they are vibrating actually quite intensely, so I wonder. I wonder if maybe like the like the stuff we discarded um, might help with that, because now now, right. now my thing is kind of like okay great it works like we put the signal in, it reverberates we extract it again everything's great, um, but it does feel to me like on the output side I guess it's fine but I kind of have like some feeling that maybe at the input you feel like we're overdriving it yeah I kind of am you don't okay. No, no, I, maybe we do. I mean, I, I guess I'm not used to looking at the tank when it's actually working. So, <laughs> so I don't really, other than when I'm actually like just trying to make terrible noises with it. Yeah. Does, does this qualify? No, this is, this is beautiful. <laughs> um, all right, but still, let's, I mean, let's, okay, let's acknowledge that this is great. Also, like, yeah. for how minimal the circuit is, I mean, this is literally one resistor one op amp that's it that's it oh it's two op amps it's one op amp chip so yeah you can make a driver with this which is great um all right but let's let's jump over to the simulator again or maybe first to the pad and let me let me talk about what i think uh, might help us so i have a feeling that maybe like what we discarded earlier so it would be like this path up here. I have a feeling that this may be um, helping us with this uh, overdrive issue because... So do you think that that's lowering the volume or do you think that that is filtering some frequencies? Um, from, yeah. I think it's filtering high frequencies. I think okay. It's, I think it's, we can test this actually. Like if we jump over to the, to the, okay. to the simulator again and we say... Because so one thing I noticed, and I mean, this is probably just from the headphones, but I could definitely hear the like high end a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So, yeah, if we try. I mean, we also jettisoned the EQ circuit that was before that. So that's, true. that's another another possible. We, we could we could also we could uh, like break that down, make that simpler. So we could basically try and just uh, uh, feed this into a low pass filter and then uh, sent this into the spring tank um, but I'm gonna add the thing from the schematic over here that's a 10 nanofarads capacitor and it's a 2k resistor boom and so right now we don't see any difference right this so this just explain like this oscilloscope down here is tied to the output of the of the driver <laughs> And right now we don't see a change, but what I'm going to try is like I'm going to like significantly uh, uh, boost this uh, oscillation frequency. I'm going to go up to 2,000 hertz, and yeah, I think you can already see it, right? So this is more quiet than the part over here. It's maybe not really significant. So it's going going down from 800 millivolts to like 740. Interesting. And if you speed it up even more, does it, is it, is it like just rolling off the top end? Is that the idea? I 
think so. Let me bump it to maybe like really extreme 10k. Oh, yeah, it gets yeah. quieter. There's a suggestion in the chat. What's the suggestion in the chat? Oh, yeah. Oh, use a square wave. Yeah, right, sure. That's a good suggestion. Because the square wave has like a lot of overtones and the triangle wave does not. So this should show us something. If we reduce this a bit again, and then we turn on the speed. Oh, yeah, right. So you can see. Yep. That this does roll off the high end, right? Because okay. like the pointy parts of a, of a square wave are like the high frequencies. And so you can see that it smooths those out. So that means that it's actually killing the high end. So I would suggest that we just, you know, add these two components to our circuit and then maybe, you know, it changes already the sound. And if that doesn't do it, we could uh, also add the low pass to the input and like see what happens if we if we sweep that. Right. So that's what the EQ circuit is. It's a low pass. The EQ circuit is a little bit more involved. So um, oh, okay, it's it's kind of a it's interesting because if you turn the pot one direction, it's actually acting as a low pass, and if you're going in the other direction, it starts acting as a high pass. So it's like both in one. Oh, yeah. that's nice. It is, but it's also it's pretty involved. Like this is very uh, yeah. No, I mean from as a user. <laughs> yes. <laughs> from a functional perspective, that's nice. Yes, actually. it is. It is. All right, so let me add, um, let me add the capacitor, the resistor. So we set 10 nanofarads cap, this thing here, and then we need a 2K. So what's your next video gonna be on, Dave? is going to be on the chase bliss mood which is a it's like a pedal it's a delay reverb looper pedal it's pretty cool okay so it's like a multi-effect or does it do the things at once it does them at once basically there's two halves one half is a looper and the other half is a delay a reverb and then this thing called slip which is kind of like a sort of like a pitch shifter kind of thing and the premise is basically that you use the micro looper to kind of build up a chord or you know just a bunch of different layers of sound and then you pass them through the reverb and the reverb is kind of like well tuned to make ambient pads so that's yeah it also has this nice thing where like um you can plug in a midi uh, adapter to it so you can like actually control the clock speed of the entire pedal using a keyboard Oh. So basically, you can play whatever pad you have in the thing like a synthesizer. It sounds so. very involved, like on the circuit side of things, I guess. Yeah, well, I mean, it's it's all uh, it's all digital, right? So. Right. Um, yeah. And the ambient ambient pad stuff is that something you use in your music that you compose? Yeah, yeah, I do a lot. Um, and I mean, also sometimes you can take those sounds. And if I sample them and make them into like an instrument, I can, even though like they started off life as a pad, I can actually use them in different ways. So maybe I can use it as keys or, you know, as a plucked sound or something, even though, you know, when it originally appeared, it was this long stretched out sound, but I'm just taking like the middle chunk of it and applying an envelope to it. So it get, actually gets a completely different character. Mm -hmm. So. And I'm assuming you're mostly working in software. Yeah. Yeah. Mostly. So. And which one do you use? Like which DAW? Mm -hmm. um, uh, live, pretty much exclusively Ableton. So yeah. Is that has it always been like your your software of choice, or did you use something else? Oh uh, no, I used um, uh, when I first got started. I used Cubase uh, for five, six years, something like that. And yeah, I loved it. I still like it. But um, yeah, when I discovered Ableton, it was just it felt more fr free. Like it was just kind of like a, a zone for experimentation. And at first I kind of didn't, I didn't gel with it for a couple of years, but then when I finally started using it, I mean, I, you know, I think there's a little bit of like Stockholm syndrome with all of these where it's like, you know how it works so well that you're just like, it must be great. Um, but uh, yeah, I just, I find it, it in terms of getting ideas off the ground, I can just like make something very, very fast with it. So that's, I mean, that's why I like it. How so. how about the like the the stock 
plugins uh, plugins that they have do you like those they're pretty good they're pretty good um i i try to use them as much as possible just so that i know that i can reopen my sessions like a few years later and not that like oh i forgot to install like some even tied reverb that i used in 2016 or whatever um so yeah they're they're some of them are great some of them are just okay but mostly they're i i think they're a lot better than people give them credit for hmm. right like i think i think people always want to think like oh you just have to buy you know vsts left and right and it's like some some for some things you're going to want to do that but yeah i always felt that the the echo plugin that they have is like quite inventive for a stock yeah, plugin i yeah. think oh i think it's great yeah and there are actually three or four different echoes and there's like one that does like filtering and there's like some spatial ones they're really good right yeah true yeah uh a oh a question uh lord zephyr would like to know what doll you use oh i i also, I also use, use ableton, ableton. Um, because actually it's kind of same tra trajectory. So I also started uh, using Cubase. That was my first, uh, my first DAW. Uh, I forgot wh which version it was, like eight or nine. Is that, is that old? Cubase nine? I don't know. I don't know. But I mean, mine was three. So <laughs> <laughs> Cubase SX3. Um, that, that was, I think that's the last one that I had. Yeah. Oh, I remember. Maybe it was five actually. I remember like at some point I, I, I found like at a flea market, I found a uh, Atari ST2400, I think it's called. It's like one of those, it looks like a Commodore 64, just like a keyboard. Sure. Yeah. You connect it to, to the TV. And I remember that like, so that thing had like to like totally rusty connectors because it was like standing out in the rain, whatever. And I just bought it for like a Euro and I brought it home. I didn't anticipate it that, it would, that it would work, but it did work actually. And then I, I got super curious about it and I researched it and it turns out that it has, um, I think MIDI. And it was like one of the first of those computers that actually had MIDI. And so I think that thing had like the very first version of Cubase like back in the day, which looks like super intense. Like the interface is like really, uh, I don't know, hard to read because it's monochrome and everything, but super interesting. <laughs> yeah, I think it was, was it, I think it must have originally just been MIDI. I think it was. Because I remember like when VST came out, I think VST came out in 98 or 99 or something like that. It was a big deal because it was like, well, first it was this plug-in format, but also like it seemed to me the vibe I got was just that like audio had been added into Cubase, like that version or the version before. And before that, it was like a MIDI sequencer. Yeah. So. Yeah. Which makes sense because like direct from like reading audio from disc in the 90s was kind of iffy. You had to have like a fast drive and maybe a special special controllers I, I can't remember i feel like I, I, I always had the wrong setup for it it was it was always like oh yeah you can you can only do two tracks yeah because if you try to add a third track it's going to stutter or something like that i feel like back in those days like i was super young in those days but uh, i got my first computer around that time and i i, I have a i have a like vivid mem memory of like there was always something wrong with my computer for the software that was I was trying to use, which was mostly like video games. Yeah. I remember it was always like this this fight uh, for uh, for memory, right? And the the programs would always tell you, oh, you have uh, K of memory, you need this K of memory. And I always remember I felt like so discouraged, like uh, you know, and I didn't know how to change it. I was just like as if as if someone tells you like, oh, your machine isn't good enough too bad you know? yeah, yeah 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 oh i had that for years i mean the whole decade of the 90s was like that because yeah i was i was a teenager and it was like it was like i couldn't run any of the games i wanted to i mean games were the worst because they always push the envelope the most they always push the hardware the most um but you know pretty quickly i kind of w wanted to just you know either make software i was really into like the idea of programming even though i didn't know how to do it yet and um i wanted to make music and yeah, I mean, it was just like, it wasn't until 97 or 98 that my computer was good enough to even be able to record anything, um, you know. So it was, it was, you know, it was frustrating. Yeah, definitely. So much nicer today where just like, you can have like the, the cheapest machine and shit will generally work, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. it's, it's. I mean, it's life-changing. True. All right, let's try this out. So I set up the capacitor. There's the 10 nanofarads, and then we have a 2K 
resistor over here. And if our theory is correct, and this should now sound noticeably different, maybe it doesn't. Let's see. Um, the blue thing. The blue thing is some some sort of capacitor. It's a foil capacitor. Um, okay. So these are actually very good. Like, uh, so this store that I was talking about earlier that I like to go to to buy parts, they're very good in the sense that they have everything but they're also very judgmental <laughs> because they're like very elitist. And I remember one time I went there and I was like trying to buy uh, electrolytic capacitors, right? Like those are the the big, like the, the, the classic ones that you would associate with caps like these. And I was buying some other stuff that was indicating to them that I was trying to build an audio circuit. And they they really gave me a hard time where like you, why are you buying this? You shouldn't buy, you always buy foil capacitors if you want to do audio. Otherwise- Is it, is it because they last longer? No, it's actually because uh, I think two main reasons. So the first one is uh, electro electrolytic capacitors are polarized. So that means that they only like to have a positive voltage on the one side and a negative voltage on the other side. And if you invert that, which when doing audio like often happens because you know like it's swinging across ground uh that's bad for the cap so it, it like shortens li its lifespan it can even like cause it to explode so <laughs> it's dangerous but then also uh, as far as i understand the foil capacitors are like um they react more linearly to a change in voltage applied to them so they're more faithful to the signal you put into them Whereas, okay. uh, especially like uh, ceramic capacitors, like they are very terrible. Like if you use them in filter circuits or whatever, you, you can actually hear that it sounds worse. So, uh, okay, yeah, it's, it's a good point, but the way they made the point was kind of uh, douchey, <laughs> I guess. Yeah. <laughs> right. Okay, so let me try and turn this up. I'd say this sounds the same. It sounds the same to me. Let me try and remove this from the power. Okay. Maybe I didn't connect it correctly. No. I think that's the same. All right. So then let's try plan B. We're going to try and add a low pass filter before the uh, before the spring tank base. No, before the uh, before the driver circuit. So let me jump over to the browser, um, and we are going to say that will take uh, our input signal here and we will run this through a resistor or in our case we're going to use a potentiometer uh, but because we want to be able to change the cutoff frequency and a potentiometer you know allows you to change the resistance um, and that's exactly what we want to do to change the cutoff of our filter and then we're going to set up a capacitor to ground over here and um, that's basically all. Now, if I take this thing and I reduce the frequency a little bit, let's pull this a little bit bigger. Okay, we need to adjust these values a little bit. Um, so I'm gonna use 100K here for the pot simply because that's what I'm just laying around. Uh, you could use other values, but um, the important part is here, the relation between the resistance and the capacitor. And the capacitor. Right, so uh, as a rule of thumb, like the bigger the resistance, the lower the cutoff frequency is gonna be. Um, and same goes for the, no, same goes, wait, let me think, is it an inverse? I think if this is small, yeah, this raises the cutoff frequency. So the smaller the cap, the higher the cutoff frequency, the bigger the cap, the lower the, the, the cutoff frequency. And uh, basically what happens is like, as you dial in a resistance, um, filling the, ca the, the capacitor up takes longer and longer. So if there's a huge resistance in the path over here, so like this, oh no, that's a very low one. So now it's very big speed this up a little bit you can see actually here with the current with the movement you can see that it's like slowly like filling and draining the capacitor and uh, as it's filling and draining the capacitor 
the voltage at this point only rises like slowly. You can see that in the oscilloscope. So you get like this triangular shape as the cap fills up and gets drained. And if we like, drastically reduce the resistance, so now I basically set it to zero, now what happens is that the cap fills up almost instantly. And so the square wave stays a square wave because the voltage at this point just gets raised and lowered uh, in sync with the input signal. And that's the way that we kind of shift the, the, the cutoff, cutoff frequency around. And I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use a 50 nanofarads capacitor here because that allows us to like, go fairly, fairly low with the cutoff frequency. I mean, we could go even more extreme, maybe. Let's do like a 22. Oh yeah, it's already super low. So the input is, let's bump this up to five volts. Right, so five volts is then like kind of pushed down to just like- To, to 1.5 volts or right, roughly. Right, right, right. So I think this should be good. All right. Mm. This is actually an application where you could use an electrolytic capacitor because the, let me turn this down. Oh, maybe not. Oh no, it's actually not true because you can see since the oscillation is like uh, going above and below ground, you can see that like whenever it's green, it's above ground. Whenever it's uh, red, it goes below ground. And you can see that um, the voltage here above the cap is also dropping below ground. And then technically the voltage here, which is ground, is higher than the voltage on the other side. And that's exactly the state that the, that the electrolytic capacitor doesn't like. And if you keep uh, subjecting it to this, it will, uh, it will die, I think. That's because it's polarized? Yeah, it's because of the internal setup of it. So actually, I, like with capacitors, I have no idea what's going on inside of them. Um, I think with the electrolytic one, it's like it's like one big long sheet of metal, like very thin, um, that's just like spun up into like a, a roll. And then I think there's like a, uh, there's like some kind of insulator like between. Oh, it's actually ah, it's two plates that are like. Uh, 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 that are like spun up against each other and they are separated by an insulator. And that insulator is, uh, I think like some sort of goo. I don't know what it, what it exactly is. And I don't know what, why those explode though. Maybe someone in the chat has an idea. But yeah, they, they can explode. Like there's tons of videos out there like on YouTube where like just unsuspecting people like try to build a circuit and then it pops very loudly. It's kind of scary. All right. Um, so I am going to switch over to the breadboard over here. And I have my potentiometer here. And I have my capacitor over here. And like I said before, basically with the, with the potentiometer, it's like if I turn this, then the resistance between the middle pin and the uh, to either side, like these pins changes. So uh, you can, as a rule of thumb, you can say, if, it, if you turn this in this direction, then the resistance between the middle pin and the, the pin on this side is gonna be zero. And the resistance from the middle pin to the other side is gonna be the the specified value. So in this- Maximum. Yeah, in this yeah. case, it's it says B104. I don't know if you can see this. And that means 100K. Yep. Yeah, that's how that works. There's a suggestion in the chat. Anthony Hart says the liquid heats up, creates steam pressure, and exceeds the integrity of the case. Oh. Oh, and it's because of the nature of the of the liquid? I guess. Goo. Of the goo. <laughs> I guess that makes sense. But I, I wonder, is this something that they knew like before they came up with this design, or is it like something that they discovered the hard way? Because always like I always feel like um, there was like this one situation where I was researching JFET transistors for a circuit I was building, and 
I was I was wondering like what happens in a specific scenario, and I found this university paper about JFETs and about like this exact like this kind of basic level of like how how can you use it, and my question was like what happens if you raise the gate voltage um, above the source voltage, I think. And then in this paper, it basically just said, we don't do that. We don't raise the gate voltage below the source voltage. And it was like so frustrating for me. Like, but what happens? Like, why do we not right. do that, right? I mean, maybe it explodes, but that's also, also interesting. All right, so I'm currently trying to route the signal into the potentiometer and then I will take the uh, signal from the other side of the of the pot and I will uh, run it into this capacitor which I now have to connect to ground Need to find a jumper this doesn't work uh, oops Okay, and now we just need to pick it up from uh, the other side of the cap, so from over here, and send it into our driver. And then we should be able to filter the input signal. I think this should sound pretty good. So, um, Wait, where do we actually need to go? We need to go, we need to go into the, oh, the non-inverting input, so that's not long enough. This is a weird skill that like over the years I picked up where it's like, I'm looking at the distance between like two points on the breadboard and then I map it in my head to the color code of the jumper. In this case, this looked very brown to me, and the brown one actually does fit, so. Yeah, see, that's a skill that I don't have. <laughs> Every single time I try like five different jumpers, and then I'm just like, oh, I don't actually have the right, the right distance. Right. Oh yeah, that's super frustrating. Like for whatever reason, like in these, in these big boxes, right, and they have like, a, they have a ton of different lengths, but there's like, yep. there's a section between. Yeah, yeah, I have a box just like that. Yeah. There's a section between the, 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 the shorter ones, and then the mm -hmm. starting bigger ones, which is no man's land. There's nothing in there. Yep, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I've had that experience a bunch of times. Yeah. Terrible. All right. I think we should. Uh... Oh, one aside. So one thing I didn't do was like when I just made all these modifications, I did not turn off the power supply. Very bad practice. I should not do this, but I got too excited. So um, just as a PSA. So like... actually, what are you using for a power supply? You have just like a bench uh, power supply just for these purposes for breadboarding? Yes, yeah, so I found, actually on Amazon, I think I found this uh, thing, the company's called Peak Tech, and it's a symmetrical DC power supply, and it's perfect for this, but it was, I think it's now discontinued, like they don't sell it anymore, uh, but it's very nice. It looks very like retro, futuristic. You can like dial in the voltage. So right now it's like dialed to 12 volts. You can go anywhere between like zero and 15. So you can also like, try stuff by just changing the input voltage and seeing what that does and it has like nice. and it has like this overcurrent limiting which saved my eyes a bunch of times because it's so easy to like burn a chip or burn an led or something and if the power supply detects that something's wrong it will just like shut off so it's perfect yeah i think that's you know at some point i'll have to get something like that yeah that's what's standing between me and greatness <laughs> right uh nick there's a question you said yeah, Lord Zeffo would like to know where you get the black pots. Are they from Erica Synths? Oh, the black pots, like uh, the one that I use here. Um, so these, yes. So Erica Synths, like at some point they sent me like a big badge of these. Um, but you can also get these like, uh, I think at Mauser and, and everywhere else. Um, I'm not sure what the make and model is. Uh, I think something like the, I think the, the company, something like Bur Burns or something like that but I would have to look it up. But yeah, the, the cool thing about these, also Dave for you is like, um, like with, with other pots, 
I don't have an example here, but with other pots, the issue is often that the connectors are like too big to actually fit into the breadboard. And so you have to like jam it, jam them in with force and that like kind of breaks the mechanism that like accepts the pins and that's terrible. And these are actually like super uh, thin and they don't do that. So these are perfect for breadboarding. Okay, moment of truth. Let's try this. Uh, so I've dialed it, I've dialed the cutoff frequency to the highest level. So we should not hear a difference right now. All right, let me turn this down. The same. Ooh. I can only hear the kick now. Cool. Very nice. <laughs> right, but I would say that you can now tell that we would actually need to amplify the output because I don't know, Dave, if you can hear that, but there's like a very like loud noise on top of it, like white noise. You hear that? No, I don't. I don't hear that from my headphones. All right. So for me, it's very loud. And also the like as I reduce the cutoff, like the my interface is right now like at the absolute like it's cranked to the max and it's still like the LEDs do not go off. So there's like it doesn't even register anything. It's pretty quiet. It's very quiet. Yeah. yeah. So I yeah. think we would need to Oh, maybe maybe that's what we would need to do. Like we would need to probably drop the amount of gain at the input so that it doesn't, you know, because right now I really have to feel it as if it runs into the threshold of when it's like actually like uh, making the yeah, spring you, you sound. You shouldn't see it, yeah, as much as you're seeing it, right? Right. So I I have a feeling that probably to make this nice we would have to like um, lower the input vo voltage and then boost the way out. Right. So we need to like increase the resistance here so that would actually drop the input gain and then the output buffer we need to turn into an actual amplifier and just like amplify the output signal and that should then in combination with the filter like give us a pretty functional um circuit i think so but still i mean this now it's like one two three four components and it doesn't sound bad i would say so that's a success on my part Definitely. Yes. <laughs> All right. And it's actually like a very, uh, um, how do you say, in German we say Punktlandung. Like we're, we're, we're on time because uh, we're almost hitting the two hour mark. So I would like to thank you, Dave, for coming on the stream. And thank uh, you. I hope this was interesting. Um, and I would love to see if you're ever in the mood to do that, to um, build like a version of this of your own. And then maybe let me hear how it sounds. Yeah, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. I've ordered the, the TLO 74s. Uh, so whenever they get here, perfect. It's the only thing that's holding me back. <laughs> I'm, I'm also super curious about hearing, like, if you manage to connect that to your absurd, like, tube thing with the spring. Yes. Yeah. That would be fun. Yeah. 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 So that's, uh, that's definitely uh, a plan. <laughs> cool. So, yeah, let me know how that sounds. And, um, yeah, I think... Uh, that's it. Um, maybe in a future stream, I will have a look at the EQ and all the other stuff. But uh, for now, that's it. If there are no more questions, Nick, there are no more questions, then okay. I'm going to end it here. So uh, again, okay. thank you thank very much, Thank you so much, much for setting this up. This was, I, I uh, personally, I, I can't speak for everybody else, but I, I learned a ton. So perfect. It's very helpful. Very glad to hear. Okay, cool. Okay. Then uh, I'll see you all soon and uh, have a nice evening.